Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Jenny Hornick and I'm the Digital Marketing Coordinator here at JMIR Publications. I'm very excited to welcome you all to today's webinar with JMIR Mental Health, the official journal of the Society of Digital Psychiatry. We have a very timely webinar topic for you today. Our panelists will be discussing using immersive virtual reality as therapy for depression. So I'll pass things on to Dr. John Torres in just a moment, but before I do, just a few housekeeping items. So first of all, you may notice already your microphones are all muted, but with that said, we do have some time towards the end of the session to answer any questions you might have. So when those come up, just drop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to those towards the end. Secondly, we are recording this session and it will be available on YouTube following. Um, so feel free to share that with any peers who may have missed out. So that's all I have for you. I will go ahead and introduce Dr. John Torres. So Dr. Torres is the director of the Digital Psychiatry Division in the Department of Psychiatry at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, an affiliated teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. He's also the Editor-in-Chief of JMIR Mental Health, so I will go ahead and pass things to you, John, to kick things off. Excellent. So thank you again to JMIR and Society for Digital Psychiatry for hosting this. We have so much to cover. I'm going to quickly introduce our two speakers, and we're going to jump into the whole world of virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality. So we have Dr. Paul, who's a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. She began her VR work in 2017, which is a very long time ago in the digital health space. So this is a pioneer who, who is doing it and has been working with Dr. Kim Bullock in her laboratory at Stanford and published many papers. We'll talk about help consult for industry, built some fascinating products and projects along the way. And we have Dr. Kim Bullock, MD, who is the founder of and the director of Stanford's Neurobehavioral Clinic in Virtuality and Immersive Technology program and lab, which I'm going to say is the first one in the nation to be doing this. Again, far long before COVID, when people weren't as excited about these technologies, Dr. Bullock, you and your team at Stanford were really pioneering it and taking a leadership service and not only doing VR and XR and AR research, but really how to integrate it into treatment for people, which I think is so unique. You can always make a thing, but you guys work on making it better. So what I wanted to quickly focus on, and I'll put it in the chat, is you guys recently published a fascinating paper that has some fascinating co-authors like David Burns, who some of you may know from the Feeling Good book, but maybe just to catch us all up and remind us on what were the details of, of what you covered, Dr. Paul. I'll drop the link in the chat so people see the paper, but maybe you can give us a refresher. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining. So um, today we're going to talk about how depression treatment can be enhanced using virtual and extended realities, and also dive into some of the hardware and software considerations. So my goal for you all before we delve into discussion is to understand how extended reality can be integrated into an existing protocol for depression called behavioral activation to review the feasibility and efficacy of doing so, and consider hardware and software options when integrating into clinical practice. But first, why do we care about using virtual or extended realities to treat depression? Well, major depressive disorder, MDD, or depression, is a global concern that causes significant distress. They're among the leading driver for years live with disability, with suicide being the second leading global cause of death for people aged 15 to 29. In the United States, a person has more than a one in five chance of suffering from a major depressive episode in his or her life. And very few people receive treatment due to barriers such as mental health stigma. While there are many evidence-based treatments for depression, such as CBT, behavioral activation is one of them. And the behavioral theory of depression says that people become depressed because they're not doing enough activities that bring them pleasure or mastery. Therefore, behavioral activation is a brief therapeutic approach that aims to increase engagement and in activities that bring people joy or make them feel accomplished, decrease engagement in activities that maintain depression, such as oversleeping and not doing positive activities, 
and problem solve with patients um, that limit their access to doing these positive activities. And research has illustrated that behavioral activation is just as effective as the full cognitive behavioral therapy model. Extended realities are becoming increasingly popular with consumers in the United States, with approximately one in five people using it since 2020, and a lot of people using it at least once per month in, 20, in 2023. Immersive technologies such as virtual reality are being used to solve multiple barriers to care, such as improving access to content not readily accessible in real life. In other words, you can use virtual reality to go places or to see things that maybe you can't do in real life. Virtual reality is an evidence-based method of delivering therapy for a variety of psychiatric disorders like specific phobia, PTSD, social anxiety disorder, and pain management. However, surprisingly few studies have examined its efficacy in depression populations. Our lab's prior research examined how virtual reality could enhance a brief behavioral activation protocol for adults with depression. We did a three-arm randomized control trial where participants in the virtual reality arm were asked to engage in these pleasant activities using a Pico headset that was loaned to them, which had 37 preloaded virtual reality, 360 degree videos they could choose from. In other words, for those of you that don't know, um, with virtual reality, you can have a video that you're looking at, just like if you're watching TV, but it's 360 degrees, completely immersive. And participants in this VR arm were compared to participants in the traditional behavioral arm and a non-treatment just control group. These results illustrated that using this virtual reality video 360 to enhance these behavioral activation activities was feasible, it was acceptable, participants enjoyed it, and it was tolerable. Results also demonstrated initial clinical efficacy in treating symptoms for depression. So we wanted to extend these findings on the basis of user feedback. So we iterated that previous prototype to a more immersive, embodied, and autonomous XR prototype using a commercially available MetaQuest 2 headset. We wanted to make this protocol as close to traditional in vivo or in real life behavioral activation by allowing participants to freely decide which activities that they wanted to engage in rather than in our original study, just needing to choose between 37 preloaded headsets. This would allow for more people to personalize their experience and it could mirror real life behavioral activation, which allows people to choose whatever they wanna do in real life, which are hundreds of choices. So the current study we'll, we'll mainly focus on today tested the feasibility and clinical efficacy of using this more immersive virtual reality device to enhance behavioral activation in an adult depression population. We measured their presence in the headset, their acceptance of the headset, any simulator sickness, which is similar to motion sickness, and we looked at their depression uh, scores using the patient health questionnaire eight and nine. This was a two-arm randomized control trial where there were participants either randomized using the virtual reality MetaQuest 2 to engage in these pleasant activities, or people would just have traditional behavioral activation where they would engage in these activities in real life. So this study used the same evidence-based brief behavioral activation protocol that was previously shown to be efficacious by the VA. Um, so it was a three, a four session, three week protocol where again, both the participants in both arms had the exact same protocol. The only difference was the participants in the extended reality arm were asked to schedule at least four of the activities in the extended reality um, headset, whereas the traditional behavioral activation participants were asked to do activities in real life. And this was done in between the meetings. Um, they also met with me four times to actually do the behavioral activation protocol, which is to look at the activities they were already doing and to minimize activities that weren't helpful for them and to try to engage in these pleasant activities between sessions. 
So results showed um, for this MetaQuest 2 that the average rating of presence was 71% and it increased each week. Notably, participants that had a relatively lower presence said that tactile sensations were important, such as feeling the sun on the skin. So the VR felt, felt less immersive. So that's a consideration. While VR can feel very immersive, um, as of now, we cannot mimic tactile sensations with just the headset alone. In terms of acceptability, how much people accepted the headset, it was an average rating of 2.8. This was on a Likert scale of zero to four, um, where four was strongly agree, meaning strongly acceptable, zero was not acceptable at all. In terms of tolerability, there was an average rating of 92% on the simulator sickness questionnaire. So overall, people found it tolerable. And as people used it, their simulator sickness decreased. So in terms of efficacy, there was no significant difference in improvement in their depression scores between the study arms, meaning that participants in both um, the extended reality behavioral activation and traditional behavioral activation arm did not have significant differences. Um, so they were very similar. And both of these arms did show significant decreases in depression scores between session one and four. So they were not different than each other and both were showing to be efficacious in minimizing depression. Um, for the extended reality arm, the average decrease was 7.4 on the PHQ-8 and PHQ-9 between the initial phone screening. And this was statistically significant and also clinically significant. So clinically significant on the PHQ-8 and 9 is anything greater than a 5. So their severity level was moved from moderately severe to mild. And in the traditional behavioral activation arm, there was an average decrease of 5.3 on the PHQ-8 and PHQ-9 between the initial phone screening and session four. And this was statistically significant and represented a change in clinical severity from moderately severe to moderate. Um, interestingly, while there was a significant decrease in scores between the phone intake and beginning of session one in the XR group, there was not the significant decrease in the traditional behavioral activation group. In other words, participants in the XR group showed a significant decrease in their PHQ scores before the study even began, between their initial phone screening and the beginning of session one. So this may illustrate an expectancy effect because the participants using XR may expect that because it's novel, they're gonna get better. Maybe they were more hopeful. So how do these results with the MetaQuest compare to the results from the prior study? Well, neither study had any serious adverse events. The prior study using the Pico VR360 had much greater headset use on average uh, throughout the duration of the three weeks for session. And this is probably because people said that it was easier to use. With the Pico headset, they just put it on, selected what was already on there, and they could use it. Whereas with the MetaQuest 2, People said that there was no pre-selected videos. They had decision paralysis. It was difficult to use. There was no onboarding process because we wanted to keep it as similar as possible between the two arms and not um, pay extra attention to one of the arms. Okay, in terms of acceptability, um, the easier device was 87% on average acceptability, whereas the MetaQuest was 71%. Again, this is probably due to the fact that the MetaQuest was more difficult for people to use. Also, acceptability asks how much you're willing to use it in the future, and people said that it was really expensive. If it was cheaper, maybe they would use it more in the future or buy one, but it was a little too expensive. In terms of tolerability, very similar tolerability, tolerability ratings, um, but just qualitatively, people using the MetaQuest said the headset was heavy and uncomfortable. Both arms illustrated habituation effects, meaning that the more they used it, the less simulator sickness they endorsed, which is um, in line with the research. In terms of efficacy, um, while the initial study did not look at statistical significance because it was just primarily a pilot feasibility study, it did show clinical um, efficacy. So again, on that PHQ, there was a clinical decrease of more than five on that PHQ. And the current study did show both clinical and statistically significant efficacy. So some important limitations is 
that the measures were subjective and completed by the participants. So both arms, um, there was no way to know that they did the activities they did. We It was just by participant report, which there's always um, potential for inaccuracies. Additionally, the PHQ is designed as a self-report measure, but because of the nature of the study, it was read orally and participants were asked to, um, with sharing the screen, they were asked to um, let me know what they were endorsing. So participants may not have answered as correctly um, as they or as accurately as they would have if they were just doing it by self-report. Additionally, we did not do a follow-up, so we don't know if the results were sustained. The study was a short duration. A lot of participants did say um, especially in the XR arm, they wished it were longer because they were getting to know and feel more comfortable with the device. And the more comfortable they were, they were more, they were more willing to use it. Additionally, because of the short duration, for example, one participant had a particularly hectic week and was feeling physically sick, um, so did not use the device and wanted to use it for an extra week. But unfortunately, that would have been a protocol break, so we didn't do that. So participants said that they wanted the study to be longer. Um, and there were also cost barriers. So with the MetaQuest, there was a lot of um, things that you can buy within it. And participants said that if they were having the study for a longer time or if they had the device, maybe they would have bought it. But because it was such a short duration, they did not want to buy um, certain applications. So therefore, they used a lot of YouTube 360 videos. So that's just a consideration. We did not want to provide them with a stipend because in real life, people have the option to go to a museum and that costs money or to take a trip and that costs money. And there's no stipend for that. So again, we wanted to keep both arms as um, similar as possible. So in terms of future directions, we want to replicate the study with a larger sample size with that lo longer trial duration and also potentially have a follow-up to see if the results are sustained. Also, it'd be interesting to do a similar study with more accessible and lower cost options, just because people did say that that cost was a barrier. And also have a similar study with older adults. So something that participants said is, wow, we could see this be really helpful for older adults that maybe can't do things that they used to be able to do or have barriers to engaging in those pleasant activities above and beyond maybe the typical um, adult. So to conclude, uh, these findings supported previous research that using extended reality as a substitute for in real life pleasant and mastery activities in this brief behavioral activation protocols for individuals diagnosed with depression is feasible, acceptable, and tolerable. This remained true even when using a more difficult and interactive headset that posed some technical and physical challenges. It demonstrated that XR BA may not be inferior to traditional BA as it was equally and statistically efficacious in improving these symptoms of depression. Clinicians can thus consider offering virtual reality simulated pleasant activities to patients when delivering behavioral activation as they could offer solutions to some of the common problems and barriers encountered when using behavioral activation. And when deciding a clinical approach and what to use, professionals may need to weigh the advantages and disadvantages of using simpler versus more complex headsets. Um, given that the study did have efficacy, clinical efficacy with both the simpler headset and the more immersive headset, um, potentially thinking that the simpler device would be preferred by patients at this time. Thank you, Dr. Paul. That's that's a lot you covered so well. And yes, a lot. And I tried to do it as quickly as possible. <laughs> oh, and there's, there's even more in the paper link that we put everyone to details there. And I, I encourage you to read it. But maybe I want to start out with a couple questions and it will open up to the audience. You had an image of what I think used to be called Google Cardboard as a way that you could kind of put your smartphone basically in a piece of cardboard and turn your own phone into a VR headset. We talked about the MetaQuest. We know Apple has a very expensive device that just came out. If I'm running a clinic and read your paper and want to do this, but I don't have the money to buy devices, can I get away with a really, can I, can I turn my phone into a VR set with Google Cardboard and, and do this? Or are there advantages to getting a better headset? 
Yeah. So I was going to, um, Kim and I talk about this all the time. There used to be, that used to be an option on YouTube where you would type in and YouTube 360 degree videos, and there would be a cardboard option and anyone could use it with their phone. And for some reason, we do not know why that has been removed as an option. So unfortunately we used to do just, just that. Um, and that was great because it had a library of hundreds, if not thousands of options that we could use yeah. for exposure and activities. Now, unfortunately, that is not available. Um, the closest thing to that now would be either what we did, down, pre-downloading videos and adapting them to a VR headset or using the MetaQuest YouTube 360. Um, okay. Yeah, for taking your own videos. But yeah, that was a big loss. If anyone could explain why it happened or knows of any substitutes, we'd appreciate that. We do use... Um, a, a telehealth kind of turnkey psychotherapy application um, that we do pay for a subscription in the clinic. So um, mental health providers could use that. Um, it's called XR Health. It was Amelia and Sias, but right now that's the only option we have that's um, been able to pivot to telehealth and be able to deliver remotely onto patients' phones. The patients don't have to pay, but our clinic pays for it. Yeah, no, that's, it's also a testament. This field moves so quickly, right? We have things that we're excited about and then those things go and, and new technologies emerge too. And I guess in that theme of things move quickly in digital mental health, you guys had done a very nice pilot study is you talked about Dr. Paul in it, in it's referenced in the paper. What is the role of pilots in digital mental health and why not? I, sometimes people say, I want to jump to a million people study today. What's the point of a pilot? And what do you see as the pros and cons or how you how you and your team think about it? I'll let, I'll let Margo. Uh, okay, yeah. you want to let me? Yeah, I think a pilot is extremely important because before you can even test efficacy, it's important just to see when you're using a new device or you're doing a new treatment, just to see, is it feasible? Can you even do this? Is this acceptable to people want to do this? Would people want to do this? And then again, when you're using a new device, you need to check tolerability. I mean, if you look at, I'm not a medical doctor, but um, I, I mean, even, even I know that when you have a new drug, you don't just test on people and just throw it out there and say, okay, like we're just going to use it on people. You, there's, there's a method to do it, um, doing it. And um, there's a paper that uh, Brandon Burke had came out with that talks about the methodology um, of- In JMIR, even. In JMIR, in JMIR, exactly. Um, that talks about the recommended methodology for doing these studies with um, virtual and extended realities and talks about the importance of creating it and doing a pilot before doing then a randomized control and looking at efficacy. And then of course, expanding to- a larger number of people. That makes I mean, sense. If we, yeah, if we're using it, um, you know, as a medical intervention, we need to use the scientific method and use, um, make sure that what we're doing is safe um, and efficacious. We're not making claims. So I, I think it's the highest standard and it helps, um, you know, doing pilots kind of is like design thinking. It, you're able to iterate and prototype and um, create better things. And for suicide um, and uh, depression, I think it's, you know, we're dealing with life-threatening situations where, you know, there's a suicide every 11 minutes in the U.S. Um, it's the leading, um, I mean, it's more common than breast cancer or homicide or melanoma. Like this is a huge public health issue. And, and if it's not done correctly, um, it, it can lead to you know, death. So this is a, this is a serious um, application of it. And I think it needs serious scientific um, scrutiny when, when looking um, and creating interventions that have claims. I, I would concur. And I think sometimes we've seen too, is people may pay, we can survey providers, patients, people of lived experience and what people want on paper. Sometimes when you actually deliver that digital health product, they use it in very different ways and unexpected ways. And there can be 
also paradoxical reactions. And this was an old paper from 2014, but someone made an app to help college students stop drinking and you could record how much you drank. And you can imagine what happened is it became a thing to see how much you could drink and who had the highest score at the end of the night. Oh my goodness. But yeah. only young, among young men, not young women, they didn't do it. But the point was you can wow. design the perfect app of the best theory and ideas. And it is interesting what happens and certainly in the VR world too, what will people use it? How will they do it? Yeah. So, so these pilots are, are critically important. It's a testament that you guys, again, were doing this long before VR was as popular or XR, I should call it now that we, we've moved up in the terminology. One other question I want to touch in is you guys had some amazing work from people of lived experience, patients. You had a co-author, David Burns, who wrote the book Feeling Good that many of you may know of. If you haven't, it, it's worth finding. It, it's sometimes some groups beginning to feel have a hard time engaging with people of lived experience or kind of finding that right synergy. How did you make a team like this work so well? Um, well, I, I can, uh, maybe I can speak to that. Um, I use a feminine style of leadership. It doesn't, you don't have to be female to have that kind of style, but a lack of hierarchy unless it's needed. So, um, and, and I think good relationships with people where it's egalitarian and, um, you can, um, there's a climate of safety. You can be creative. You know, for me, um, I just had so much fun, um, both David Burns and Jeremy Balenson were kind of like my mentors doing really cool things that I just wanted to hang around them and, and they inspired me. And so I think, um, yeah, you have to have a creative juice going. And I think there's actually research on this, um, that when you get a good group, um, uh, together, uh, that that's just so important that the productivity can like just escalate exponentially when you have the the right chemistry. Yeah. And I can speak to what Kim said, because Kim was my mentor. And the reason why I'm in this, I uh, even did any of this research and just that style of leadership always made me feel really comfortable. And it was extremely collaborative and there's just, yeah, a very deep element of trust. I would say it's very important to trust the people that you work with. And I've admired Kim um, since the moment I've met her too. So there's just that um, that trust and uh, choosing people that you believe in. And it, it may be slightly intangible, but I think it's very clear evidence that leads to very strong tangible digital health products with these teams in it. And I think we've just seen it across a lot of papers. And I think the field is finally beginning to realize the importance of this, even though we may have known it for some time. So it's it's nice to see beacons of it working. One last question for me, then we'll probably have about 10 minutes of audience questions in it. If I'm a clinic director, I've read the paper, I, I've seen this, I'd say, I really want to introduce some VR into my clinic. I want to help my patients, but I don't have this Stanford laboratory at my beck and call to come do it. I can't. What is the best first step? Should I be reading something? Should I be going to a meeting? Should I go buy a MediQuest? Like, what are my best three steps uh, to get started? There aren't best practices. And um, I think there's a there's a training gap. And hopefully over time that will change. But I would say just just do it. I mean, if, if you're talking about using it with patients, you know, um, the people that are using it most with patients are in private practice and um, just, um, you know, start to uh, use it because one of the biggest barriers in its use. So we've got, you know, 30 years of data on how it's efficacious and it can decrease barriers. Um, but uh, the biggest bottleneck right now um, to the adoption is provider acceptability. So, um so I think going out there, trying it, being brave, uh, even though there's not, you know, we don't have workshops on how to use it yet, um, maybe just um, uh, experimenting yourself. I, I think that really the um, XR Health, I, I, I don't, I have no conflicts of interest. I, I'm, I'm not, I, um, don't get anything yeah. from them. They are the only product right now that's easy to use in a telehealth setting. Um, 
uh, that you could just you could easily just start to implement, and it's based on evidence based protocols of evidence based psychotherapies. So, I think that's one of the easiest ways to get started. That that makes sense, and I think reading has been how I've learned a lot about it too. Oh, yeah. it, it sounds like Dr. Paul, you found mentors in this space. Clearly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's what I would suggest. I was going to say because there is a training gap. Um, finding a mentor, reaching out, um, shadowing, and then yeah, just delving right in. So maybe for some audience questions, we'll get to as many as possible, but I'll start with this one. How crucial is a sense of mastery in activity within the virtuality for short and long-term success of behavioral activation for depression? So how crucial is mastery in the VR itself for those outcomes? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So with behavioral activation, traditionally, you want to have a nice um, balance of doing pleasurable activities, things to just make you feel good and mastery, things that are making you feel accomplished. So thinking of if you're just pleasure, 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 um, you can still feel low if you're not feeling like you're accomplishing things. And if you're like a workaholic, just accomplish, 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 you can get burnt out and also feel depressed. So it's important to have that balance. Um, I think that's a great question. We didn't specifically look at pleasure versus mastery in the, in the headset. Um, there were one of the reasons why we did want to use the MetaQuest is because there were, there are applications you can use that do give you a sense of like mastery. Like there's more puzzle focused, um, type applications or, there's, you know, learning um, types of things that you, videos that you can watch or do, whereas just simulating pleasant activities is just pleasurable. Um, but we did not look at specifically that difference between whether or not they engaged in pleasurable or mastery activities. The psychoeducation was provided that both in a balance is necessary, but we didn't, we did not specifically look at that. But that that's a really great question and something to definitely consider for future studies. Yeah. And I think, oh, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I was going to say too, I think also embedded in that was like, yeah, maybe there's a mastery of even getting to know how to use VR and we didn't examine that, but that's a, a good point. Maybe we need to look at that, but there was a lot of frustration there um, and, and kind of um, barriers to even mastering getting the VR headset. So I think we talk about it in our paper. Yeah. And this is a broader question. Again, thanking you for the research is saying, can you share your thoughts on the future role of XR for mental health in general? Would you see, would what do you see as kind of the major delivery approach in the future? How, how far are we going to go? Which again, so hard question to predict the future, even for a psychiatrist and clinical psychologist teaming up. But w where are we maybe going with this type of work? Well, I I think well I'll I'll, I'll let you <laughs> go after me, but I I think. Um, yeah, I think um, XR is just going to be uh, a very common technology, just like we have TVs. It's going to be a modality of delivery of all sorts of information, and so I think I think we're going to use it a lot and um, to replicate and create experiences and and in in especially in psychotherapy. Um, so I I see it just being ubiquitous in all sorts of in assessments and and in delivery. But Margot, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think now with, you know, the Apple Vision Pro, um, I know it's extremely expensive right now, but the iPhone used to be very expensive as well. And now, as Kim said, it's pretty ubiquitous. I feel like, you know, the Vision Pro is, it's great. It's just exorbitant right now. Um, so I do think that once these cost barriers um, or eliminated, it will be, it'll be very commonly used for just a lot of things for productivity and um, for therapy and for, yeah, whatever. It, yeah. It seems like the future is quite bright for, for the set of technology. A couple questions I'll merge into one is you point out this interesting potential placebo response and people who knew they were going to get the yeah. The our treatment got better before starting it. And again, I'll say as a psychiatrist and doc, Dr. Bulk, I can persuade, we, we know the placebo effect is part of how medications work too. We're, we're not saying it's a dirty thing. It's a bad thing. It's just part of that related to the placebo. Is there a dose effect, do you think, or people who maybe spend more time using it? Or is there a certain threshold you have to reach? Or 
are, are we seeing anything towards dose effect or we just don't know about dose yet? Yeah, so I think that there, you know, we didn't specifically look at that just because our numbers were not high enough to examine that. Um, but the idea is the more of these positive activities you engage in um, per day, the, the, the better your mood. So if we're going to say that doing these activities in extended reality is similar to doing them in real life, then one could say that it would be, it would be similar. Again, my idea isn't to say to people, don't do things in real life, just use XR. The idea is that XR can be used as an adjunct to real life for people that maybe can't do things in real life, either because the barrier is too high, like they're just too depressed that it's hard to actually get up. They can just pick up their headset. Um, and people even said qualitatively, like doing these things in, in VR, one made them want to do them in real life. Like someone said, after looking at a beach in VR, I wanted to go to the beach. And I said, that's great. Yes. Like yeah. do it. Woo. Um, so that's the idea or for people that have physical limitations and can't, you know, go for a hike or can't travel like they used to, to be able to do these things in XR. So again, when we looked at the people in extended reality, I didn't say to them, you cannot do anything in real life. They just um, needed to do at least four of these things in XR. And a lot of them said that it, they then wanted to do things in real life. Which is a, a beautiful way to make behavioral activation work because I try. it's hard to get people to do this. As we all know, behavior change is hard. Yes. And any tool that helps you do it is really yes. powerful. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you need to imagine yourself or have motor rehearsals going on, and this might um, might help in that. But again, your question, we, we don't know. This is just like the first study. We hope that it will inspire all sorts of studies, uh, yeah, to understand this expectation effect and whether there's a dosage effect. I think these are great questions. Yeah. We maybe have time for one more question. This one is an important one, but a hard one. It says, what would your top one or two design recommendations be for future digital health projects with HR to maximize engagement and acceptability? So I don't know if we can do this one quickly, but maybe your hot takes on designing these for success. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough, right? So I think to the earlier point of the importance of just design thinking and completely um, continuing to iterate I mean, using the 360 degree video, people said they wanted more interactivity and more options and we gave them more options. They said they had decision paralysis and they were more likely to do 360 video. So I think in general, maybe a hybrid. So I did test like the Vision Pro and the cool thing about that is you can access your own video library or photo library or easily record your own videos and then watch. So I could see that being really interesting, especially because there's research that the activities you engage that are more values aligned, that's also more beneficial. So for people who are watching things of their family, maybe you're like videos from a fun trip, that could potentially be really, really great. But um, it's tough because there's individual differences and different people have different preferences. So I think that's why doing studies using various devices and various iterations is really important so that we can see what people like, what people don't like, and continue to iterate. That makes yeah. sense. Any parting words, Dr. Bullock? I know we've, we're have we going quickly, but you've covered yeah. a lot so far. I think academia and industry need to partner and um, we need to listen to each other. And so I really hope that there's some industry leaders because they're the people that can take these ideas and the evidence to market. And I think what we need uh, are more um, in this space is um, we need more options for delivering remotely to people's phones uh, in remote settings. Um, and that they could practice in between on their own without the therapist as homework um, to have these. And it needs to be easy to use and the onboarding needs to be easy. So I know those are kind of big asks, but that's what that's what we need. And they need to be evidence-based based on evidence-based psychotherapy. So 
industry needs to have clinicians on board, especially psychiatrists too. There's um, so, uh, there seems to be a dearth of psychiatrist um, consultants in this space. Yeah. No, and I think I think we're seeing the push towards evidence. It's almost like the first wave was access. Everyone has an app and can do it. Now we're saying, well, an access to a low quality thing doesn't really make a difference. We're probably in the age of high quality. And can we bring it together? So, so I, I think it's beginning to change. Yeah. For, for that. And it's, it, but you guys have seen this for a long time since the beginning of kind of this XR field. You've probably chronicled the ups and downs of it. But I, I think we're in an up. But I, I want to break here. Just, I know we try to keep these short. The links will post to the two papers, the one, of course, that Dr. Bullock and Dr. Paul published and then the paper that Dr. Brickhead, and you were part of that too, Dr. Bullock, kind of setting out some standards. So we'll post those two as well as that for more detail. So thank you everyone to listening and thank you to our guests. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.